Steve Alter from the University of San Francisco. This summer, I'm going to a business informatics conference that has two separate workshops on something that's called enterprise engineering. Okay, business informatics guys think that enterprise engineering It's fundamentally ridiculous to say that someone could engineer an enterprise. And in a way, that's kind of like talking about services because one version of service is kind of like the first two presentations that were really about these are machines that are going to operate in a very well specified way. All we have to do is specify it correctly, install it correctly, we're going to get great benefits from it. A different version of services is I have to understand what, what customers really want and I have to have empathy with them and so on. So it's more like a socio-technical, human-to-human kind of service. So I wonder, to what extent do you guys believe that you really could engineer um, enterprises? Or to what extent do you believe you could really engineer services where people are involved? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I believe there are maybe the two approaches. I think asking the customers of what they want, obviously, is the traditional approach. But more importantly, the second one, which I think you're calling the enterprise engineering, if I understand this correctly. I think the key there is to understand the value of what you have, whether it's machines, uh, systems, solutions, whatever you have, and bring this up. And we see this happening over and over. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, when Apple came up with the iPad, many people did not think they needed this. And if uh, Steve Jobs went and asked the customers, probably he would not get the requirements in that fashion. It's more from the inside out. And to me, that's maybe the most challenging aspect, but maybe the most interesting as well. And I think the only way to understand this is to understand the core technologies and capabilities, or the core verticals, whatever you're looking at, I don't want to call it just technologies. To understand the capabilities or the values that you could bring up. And this, in order to do this, I think it's a comprehensive, we need to understand the entire space, we need to understand the detailed information, otherwise it's a really a tough job to accomplish. Perhaps the session should have been called Enterprise Imagination instead of Engineering, because that's really what people have to look at today, because as you were saying and as we've talked about, Customers and consumers will find a way to get things done that maybe the providers of those services and solutions have not thought about yet. Um, I think it was Eric von Hippel who came up with that theory a number of years ago around lead users. They will build things if they can't buy them from somebody else. And so I think that maybe that's the approach that we have to look at today. Historically, it's been more of an engineering, we'll build it because that's what we think that you need. But to, in today's world, with so many bright minds and so many innovations that are already out there, there's an app for everything. Um, it, it's more of an approach of let's listen to the customer more, let's be prepared to delight the customer with what we think that they will want, and then be prepared to adjust and fix it if they say, oh, I absolutely hate that, and that's not really what I wanted at all. So I, I think that maybe it's a fundamental, again, we're talking about shifts and changes and where the directions that we're going in through these transformations. And there's some definite mind shifts that we have to look at from the engineering perspectives. <clears throat> Tomorrow we will have a, a talk from Tim Brown, IDEO, I guess, as far as I know. And in one of his speeches a few years ago, he said that we can approach innovation from three angles or three paradigms. One is coming from R&D, from the typical technology side, then the other probably path to innovation is from the business side, so looking for customer segments, uh, their demands, and so on, and typically applying, uh, approaching innovation from this side. And what they do at IDEO very often, and this is probably referring to what you said, uh, Klein, um, you can approach innovation from it in a human side. So you look at humans, their behaviors, you actually apply um, um, ethological approaches and so on to that. So while the, the, the first two mentioned approaches are probably more of an you know, closer to the typical kind of business thinking or engineering thinking, the last version is probably much more fuzzy. So I wouldn't say that uh, enterprise engineering uh, as a, is, is the perfect term to cover all aspects of innovation. So it probably applies to some of them, but not all of them. Doug Morris from the Service Innovation Transformation Group. Um, 
we've been doing this for a long, long period of time. I mean, we've been involved in service science and so forth so for nine, ten years now. But as one of the things that we've uncovered in, in private practice is, is looking at businesses, education, etc. And there's a service economics problem here, right? So when you talk about uh, you know outcome-based um, delivery of, of company goods or company value, um, changing the economic values of the company, there is no mechanisms for companies to deal with that. From a university perspective, um, they teach what they get paid to teach. Um, and those incentives are based on 200-year-old models of, of what the economics look like. So we teach people um, you know, about traditional manufacturing, supply chain, uh, engineering, all of those functions, and yet we're saying the economy has shifted to, to a, you know, a whole new services base. So just a you know, brief comment you know, on how can we change um, the value structure such that from a societal benefit, from a government benefit, from a company benefit, um, we're actually recognizing the economic benefits of the shift to the services economy. I guess to, to quote an overquoted uh, Steve Decoveyism is begin with the end in mind. Uh, a lot of times you really have to think differently about where, where you're trying to go in order to take a different road. I think we all face traditional ways of solving problems. This is the way it's always been done. Uh, things are being done radically different. Uh, I also heard the speaker say, you know, if you can conceive it, it can be achieved, and if it can be achieved, someone will do it. And if you choose not to do it, it'll be someone else, it'll be your competitor. So I think uh, it's been hit on a few times that uh, innovation will occur, society will find a way, so to speak. Uh, so you really have to begin, I would say start with beginning with the end in mind. If we see paradigm shifts, uh, what, where do you want to be, and don't try to get there from where you are right now, but rather try to figure out how to, to land at your landing point. Well, that's one of the valuable things about the university environments. We, we depend on you all to take that longer term approach. You're looking out beyond five years from now. And yeah, sometimes it takes 10 years to come up with what that really new direction is going to be. Um, I'll use another different quote since I used to work for a very large Canadian company that's not around anymore. It's around playing hockey. And Wayne Gretzky said, you don't skate to where the puck is at, you skate towards where the puck is going to go. And so I think that's a very, um, along the lines of your, your thoughts, is we want to be skating where we think that puck is going to be go and where we'll be able to hit the easiest goal from. Uh, yes, please. Ed Perlew, Fotizo Group. Uh, one of the things we're finding with our, our clients who are primarily manufacturers uh, in the B2B markets, shifting to services, our building service models. The issue is not the technology. You know, they've got devices out there deployed, they've got monitoring. The issue is a cultural and a business model issue. You know, they're, they're really struggling with this shift from making products to customer outcomes, as you mentioned. I mean, do you think we're doing enough research-wise to understand all the social mechanics and dynamics behind that versus the technology-driven issues? Uh, and what should we be looking at differently? Well, I mentioned that at Sienna, we're, we are just making this transformation ourselves. Uh, our sales force is largely a box sales force. <laughs> but let me meet you with you, Mr. Customer. You, you tell me what you need. I have my speeds and beats chart, I have my lookup table, and voila, here's my quote. Um, and software and services gets given away because it's such a competitive uh, market. That's the, you know, we want to preserve hardware. I mean, that's the, the mindset. So we're going through a, I would say, Salesforce transformation in our company as we transform our customers' uh, business models. Um, I can't really speak on research. I know there's a number of books that are coming out now. Um, I'm uh, in the book of the quarter club, so we were, our group is, sort of asked to, to do these, uh, you know, what's the latest literature out there, sort of critique it and have a discussion. Um, uh, it's a good question about the research. I know we're, we're living this right now, so I, I, I'd, I'd be really interested to see anyone else's comments in the space. Yeah, 
Sure. Monique Morrow, Cisco. Uh, I hear, I'm hearing a lot of language that's um, very similar to uh, consumption economics parlance. And um, I would agree that there's a bit of disintermediation that's happening in the industry. The question is always who your customer is. Uh, your customer for today may not be your customer for tomorrow. And the organization, there are a huge amount of multifaceted organization dynamics that are occurring. Um, juxtapose that with real time. When you're talking about DevOps, things have to happen in real time. I want a service on demand. What, what does that look like? Um, so I appreciate very much the, the, the challenges here. Do you have any, any thoughts about what real time would look like in terms of actual disintermediation and what the service opportunity is? Because that's really where I think the industry is going. And by the way, I strongly believe it's extremely difficult to understand to really understand what business outcomes are. Because it depends on the organization you're, you are actually interfacing with from a business perspective or an organization perspective. Because the dynamics are very, 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 um, uh, well, let's say, complex. And it, it's about, you know, if I can give you an ROI in 14 months, maybe that's a starting point. And, and I absolutely also agree that technology is not it may be an enabler, but that's not the starting point. Can you clarify your question on the real time? I'm, I'm I don't. Yeah. You know, so, so what I what I'm picking up in the industry today is this notion of I want a service on demand. I want something real time. You know, this has uh, implications to you know how do you actually develop a service, right? How do you actually get it to market, uh, etc and so on, and I would agree that it's not the linear process that we have. And also, when you, you're thinking about DevOps in the Valley, people are thinking about 24 hours, is it, what, what goes on into that development process? It's more of a development process from a service development perspective. It's the background I have. So, so I'll answer it from my world of, uh, again, we, we sell to Googles and Facebooks that are direct customers, and we also sell to the large, service providers, and the large service providers take a long time to develop new services. And if you put yourself in their shoes, it's a messy problem. I've got okay, very good, so I don't have to explain it too much. Um, so we, we are attempting, in fact, bandwidth on demand is one such service that we are trying to bring to market. And there are pricing models, uh, there are delivery models, there are the back office and OSS problems, all, the, all these are, there's, I, I used to quote it as Hillary step, and if you're familiar with Mount Everest, that you, after you go through all the trials and tribulations, right, almost before you get to the peak, there's yet another looming obstacle, which is known as Hillary step. So as much as you've laid your groundwork, you've, uh, you, know, you have your oxygen tanks, you still have this, and, and this is the OSS integration problem. Um, so, so we use the word transformation, and the, the service providers must transform or will be not having those as customers, because they will no longer be customers because their models have uh, evaporated. So we're working, we're working through one such uh, problem, but it ultimately boils down to having systems in place that can, that can deal with it. The underlying network isn't the problem, it's the, it's, it, it'll function, it'll do its job, but how do you wrap it up? How do you make sure there's inventory? How do you control it? How do you deal with all the other problems is the complex problem. Um, others are solving it. Google has solved it in a different way. And, and I don't want to use the SDN buzzword here, uh, but that's the, you know, the panacea of all things will be SDN. So how's that for an answer? We almost made it all the way through the without getting out there. Almost. 